Good job, Mike. That was fun. Great job to our music team and our children's ministry, putting that all together. That was really great. Really enjoyed that. We're in a series called Managing God's Money, and uh, we've been talking about this on and off for four or five weeks now. We've had a couple breaks in between. Our first sermon was on the insecurity of our finances, the insecurity of that paper stuff and those coins and those digits that you look at on your screen when you look at your bank account. And the point of that whole message was to make you insecure and help you realize that there is no security in trusting in your retirement plan or the money that you have in the bank. Because we talked about that and we said, you know, our money, this paper stuff we carry around, is only as valuable as the government says it is, and it's only as secure Uh, as much as we trust our government, that's how much we can trust our money. So I don't know about you, but I don't know many people who actually trust the government. And so there's just no security in it. And the point wasn't that you shouldn't have money or save money or plan for retirement. The point was just that you would put your faith and your trust in something that is secure no matter what, and that's God. He is always secure and always trustworthy. And then our second sermon was on God's economy. And again, that word trust came on, came up. and, And the whole theme of that message was Um, In God's economy, the way he operates is he wants you to trust in him, not your own effort. So we looked at some passages of scripture that have to do with rest, and then we looked at how God tied rest to money, and uh, and really the whole point, uh, God's whole point to Israel, and I think also to us, is stop trusting in what you can produce. Yes, you should work. Yes, that's in the scriptures as well. Yes, you should be smart and be a good manager of God's money. But at the end of the day, God wants you to put your faith in him, not your own efforts, not in what you can produce or what you can accomplish. Today, we're going to look at dad's wisdom. And I, uh, I landed on that this morning, actually. I came in here yesterday and I, I preached through this message and it just felt like dry to me. I don't know, maybe some of you preachers... Uh, have experienced that, you practice and you just go, something's wrong with this message, I just don't like it, I don't want to preach it. And, uh, and I realized between last night and this morning uh, that it actually feels just like a lot of those things in that video that we had. Put the milk away, you know, uh, clean your car, uh, be home by midnight, you know, nothing good happens after midnight. Those things, those little tidbits that our dads say to us, um, and maybe you say to your own kids, and, and our kids just kind of go, ugh, you know? My son and my daughter would agree that nothing really happens after midnight that you wish you were a part of, right? Like, you know, you find out the next day that they decided at 1.30 in the morning to drive down to Houghton and see if they could find some Cheetos at a gas station, and they blew a tire, And they tried to call everyone that they could and couldn't get a hold of anybody. And they spent three hours trying to get the spare off the back of the van. And then they had to push the car across the parking lot. And they walked home from Houghton at 4 o'clock in the morning. Boy, who wakes up the next day and goes, wish I would have been there for that? You know? Nobody. But for some reason at 11.30 at night when your kids call and say, can I stay just one more hour? And you say, not really. You need to just come home and go to bed. They're like, you're the worst parent in the world. And, you know, we make exceptions. But sometimes dad's wisdom just feels like, I know this is true, but I don't really want to hear it. And that's exactly how I felt about this message. Like, all this wisdom on Scripture from Proverbs, the whole thing I'm like, I know this is true, but I don't really want to hear it. And I don't really want to preach it. I don't even want to think about it because then I have to be different. And I have to continue to make changes. Now here's here's the thing you should know about me and the deacons know about me. I'm really bad with money. Like I really struggle with money. I struggle to save it. I struggle not to overspend. I struggle to be to be smart and save for the future. I mean, the only reason I have an retirement retirement account is because of our deacons. I would have never saved any money for retirement. I'm not very good with money. So this message to me is like, okay, okay, I'll try again. I'll try again, you know? So easy to preach. 
it's true, it's wisdom, but I think it's hard to live. Now, some of you are natural savers. You're just good at not spending. Um, to you, the candy bar in the store just feels like a bad idea. Like, and I get that. Praise the Lord that you're that way. Uh, have grace for the rest of us. You just have different problems than we do. Um, because to me, the Snickers bar is always a good idea. That Mountain Dew and that Snickers bar, good idea. I got $3 left in my bank account. I can still get that Snickers bar, right? So, you know, have grace for us, for the rest of us. I also think there's a group here, and, and I'll come back to this, that has been trying. You know, I'm kind of falling into this group. I've tried these same things and applied these same things to my life over and over again, and I struggle to accomplish them. So sometimes it just feels easier to just give up. And I want you to recognize today that dad's wisdom is always true, it's always applicable, and he loves you, right? He loves me. I'm not, he's saying to me and to you, I'm not telling you this, son, because I'm trying to deprive you of something joyful. I'm trying to bless you. And so I'll tell you again, just one more time, apply this to your life, and you'll be blessed because of it. And so between last night and this morning, I had to just change my thinking about this truth, because it's true, but I had to, to rethink, how am I going to get excited about this, right? I had to remember that my father loves me and that this is for my good. So, all right. Now, if you can point at my life and go, well, you're not very good at that, good for you. You, you know me well enough to know I'm not very good at some of this stuff. That doesn't change that it's true. So, so today we're going to look at dad's wisdom. There's four ways we spend our money. We tend to spend it. We tend to pay off debt. We tend to save it, and then we give it, and we kind of do it in that order. <coughs> we, uh, we get our paycheck, and uh, we go, oh, we got money in the bank. Let's go out to dinner, uh, or let's buy something, or whatever, and then we go, oh, bills came in, and we got to pay those so that we can keep our house or keep our car or whatever, and then maybe if there's a little money left, we put it in the savings account, and then after that, if there's anything left after that, then maybe we give. Now, not some of you have conquered um, the trusting God thing and the giving thing, and you've rearranged your life. That's good. You've taken a step in the right direction. I'm sure there's some other things today that God was going to convict your heart about that you're going to need to work on. So, but that's kind of how we tend to, to do things in that order, at least our culture does. So dad gives us wisdom in all four areas. Uh, all four areas of how we spend money, Dad speaks into. And so I want to look at those today. Now, what I wish Dad would say is, I think you should spend all your money on new wheels and tires for your truck. Why wait? They'll look really cool, and you can figure out how to pay your mortgage later. That's what I wish Dad would say to me, but he didn't. Instead, Dad says, spend cautiously. Dad, from his word, says, spend cautiously. We tend to think that we just need to make a little more money. That's really how we think. I mean, it doesn't matter how much you make. And I've been on the very, very, I don't, don't want to say poor, like living on the street, but close, poor side of things. And, and then we've experienced some really blessed times, uh, my wife and I. And it didn't matter how much came in, we always seem to find a way to spend it all. And we always seem to find a way to think, if we had just a little more money, that would solve our problems. And that's a really dangerous place to land, to, to start to think we need to just make a little more money. Let me just tell you from experience, it does not matter how much you make, it's always going to be tempting to spend more than you brought in. And what you desperately need to do is learn how to spend more cautiously. Almost always the problem is contentment. Almost always the problem is learning to just be content with what God's trusted us with. Now, this is the best picture I could find, and it's from my file, so it's, it's about 10 years old. <clears throat> so it's changed a little bit. And I did do some research and find some new numbers for you. It's kind of interesting. So about 10 years ago, the average American was in debt for almost $17,000 in credit card debt, and then had about $30,000 in auto loans, and student loans, about $50,000, and mortgages, about $182,000, average American family. So what's interesting is this number at the bottom, $182,000, that's now about $215,000. Inflation happens, life changes. So the average home, uh, home household has is, is got a mortgage for about $215,000. 
This hasn't changed too much. And I don't know, I could not figure out if that was per household or per person. So maybe it's changed because now maybe it's $50,000 per person instead of per household. I can't believe how much college costs. Um, but student loans are still hanging out there. Auto loans has gone up to about $35,000. Average American household is about thirty-five dollars But what's crazy is this number's gone down. Recently, this, you, know, you look online, the average household is about $6,500 credit card debt. And I'm like, what happened? Did Americans wake up? Did they get smart? No, we didn't get smart. We figured out how to, to uh, attach our debt to our homes. Now, the average American has $6,500 in credit card debt and $17,000 in a, a variable interest rate home loan. And what we do is about every four or five years, we run that credit card debt back up to six, seven, eight thousand dollars $8,000, and then we transfer it over to our home equity loan. So now, instead of just a credit card debt of seventeen dollars we got a, a credit card debt that we can't figure out how to pay back for $7,000, and we have this $20,000 and increasing home equity loan because that's a better interest rate. The problem is not that you don't make enough money. The problem is not that I don't make enough money. The problem is that we struggle to be content with what God has given us. And so because of our culture and the way our country works, we just keep finding ways to go in debt and refinance it. Now, <clears throat> God, our Father, would tell us to spend cautiously. Proverbs 25, 28. A man without self-control is like a city broken into, like a city broken into and left without walls. The primary defense in a city is the walls. No wall, no defense. That's what God, that's what our Father would say about money. No self-control, no defense against making huge financial mistakes. Shopping has become a recreation for us. We buy stuff just to feel good. We use Amazon as therapy, right? We don't feel good today, so we get on Amazon and we, we you know, and how many of you do this? You get on Amazon and you shop till you drop, but you cannot afford any of that stuff, so you put it in your cart and then you move it to the save for later category so that I don't have to shop more later. And when I actually get five bucks in the bank, then I can impulse buy that thing that I shopped for. Okay, if none of you do that, then again, I'm just the most sinful person in the room. So self-control, right? right? God says, have self-control. Wait on that stuff. You don't need to use Amazon as therapy. That stuff that you're buying isn't going to make you happy. What you desperately need to find is contentment with what I've provided for you. Instead of trying to figure out a way to make more money, try to look at why you're so discontent. Why you can't live with what you have. <clears throat> we impulse buy. The average American spends about $5,400 per year impulse spending. Now, interesting, a year and a half ago, uh, food and groceries, these all were still pretty consistent, usually mostly on food and groceries. So I got to have the Snickers bar on the pop, or we're going to stop by McDonald's after our trip to Walmart. Um, sometimes it's clothing, sometimes it's household goods. Take out pretty often. Shoes, I don't even understand that. Um, I've just never been into shoes. My son's back there, yeah! My son and my wife love to buy shoes. <coughs> Since the pandemic, the greatest area of impulse buying, this has actually gone up by 18% since the pandemic. We, we've impulsed by about 20% more than what we were. And it was cleaning supplies and toilet paper. So in the last year and a half, Man, if we saw cleaning supplies, bleach, or toilet paper, it was like, gotta have it, right? And I, I, I don't understand that either. There are some people, actually, who have told me in this church that they have a whole room filled with toilet paper. And I, was, I don't, okay, praise the Lord. Glad you have that. I know where to come when I run out. So, <coughs> be content. Stop overspending. Have some self-control. That's what your father would tell you. You don't need the Snickers bar or the wheels and tires for your truck. Just be patient. Just trust me. Proverbs 21, 17. Whoever loves pleasure will be a poor man. He who loves wine and oil will not be rich. Make sure you catch the word loves. 
loves pleasure, loves wine and oil. Wine and oil for us would be like maybe steak dinner or lobster tail, or, or maybe it would just be Pizza Hut. Whoever loves going to Pizza Hut three times a week will not be rich, you know? It's not wrong, Robbie, to go to Pizza Hut. It's not. You can go once in a while. You just can't go every day, right? You can have a steak dinner once in a while. You can have a lobster tail once in a while, but don't do that every day. You're never going to have money. Have a little self-control. Okay, three common strategies to overspending. And this is where it feels like Dad saying the same things to us over and over, but it's wisdom and it's true. So we're going to run through these real quick. Under spending cautiously, every financial advisor that has a brain would tell us these are good ways to be more careful with the way we spend our money. The first one is have a budget. Have a plan. Spend your money on paper before you spend it for real. Proverbs 21.5 The plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance. But everyone who is hasty, everyone who's hasty, who, who has to make the decision now and get it, you know, there's a really good deal. That, that's my thing. I just fall into that every day. Oh, such a good deal. This table saw. I start, okay, some of you have gotten Facebook messages from me with pictures of table saws. I have two table saws and I can't buy this table saw, but somebody needs to buy it because it's such a good deal. That's my, that gets me every time. Whoever's hasty comes only to poverty. You don't have any money, Pastor Tony, but you have three table saws in the garage. What is wrong with you? Have a plan. Spend your money on paper before you spend it for real. I know that some of you have tried that for years. Dad, because he loves you, would say, try again. Keep trying. If you apply even a little bit of this to your life, It's going to make a positive impact and it's going to bless you. So keep trying to learn how to spend cautiously. Use cash. Now that, again, is going away, but it's still possible in our culture to do that. And really the way we need to do this is after we create a budget, you take, at the end of the day, you have some left and you say, this is for entertainment. This is for my candy bar and my pop. This is for my $5 coffee. And and depending on how much you make, it might be $20 a week. It might be $20 a month. It might be $100 a week. I don't know what your, what your entertainment money, your fun money is, but if you, at the end of your budget, take that money out of the bank and put it in an envelope and say, this is all we're going to spend on entertainment, man, it's really going to help you to think about spending more cautiously instead of just running that debit card. There was a time for a long time where my wife and I had to do that even with just groceries because every week we're going over you know, $50 or $70 on groceries and we had to just start putting it in the envelope and saying, you know, it's embarrassing. You get to that checkout and, and they get to a certain point and you just go, stop ringing. And they're like, what are we going to do with all that stuff? I don't know what you're going to do with it, but I can't pay for it, so stop ringing that stuff up. And you're putting the stuff that you're not sure if you're going to be able to buy at the end of the belt. Use cash and say, this is all we can afford to spend. And talk yourself down. I've gotten really good at this. This is one that I'm good at, at um, doing with my own life. Last time we talked about this, um, I told you that I, draw, I walk around Cabela's with a shopping cart when I go to Grand Rapids. And I fill the whole cart, and then I just get to the door, and I just leave the cart, and I walk out. I got to shop the whole time, and I didn't buy a single thing. And what I tend to do now... So just yesterday, I, I, I got all this free dirt. Free stuff cost me a fortune. I got all this free dirt in this lot next to my house. And these huge boulders were all in this dirt. And so I dug the boulders out and I piled them out on the street. And I started thinking, how am I going to get rid of these boulders? And I thought, I'm going to have to call an excavator to bring a dump truck and load these up. This is probably going to cost me five, six, eight hundred bucks. And I happened to have Joel's backhoe at my house because I was fixing a hydraulic line because we are working on the building. And I thought, what would I do if I didn't have any money? That's a famous talk yourself down. What would I do if I didn't have any money? I thought I would dig a hole and I would bury those boulders. And so I took Joel's backhoe and I dug a hole big enough to bury your car in it. And I put all those boulders in the hole and I covered it up with dirt and it didn't cost me a penny. That simple thing, what would I do if I didn't have any money? Okay, I need a new winter coat. What would I do if I didn't have any money? Well, I would probably go to Salvation Army. 
Well, maybe we should try that. What if I couldn't even afford to go to Salvation Army? Maybe I would talk to my church family and tell them I don't have money for a coat. I, I mean, I don't know. You just come up with necessity is the mother of invention. And when you say, I cannot buy snow tires, when you just tell yourself that, all of a sudden you got to figure out a way to not drive around on those bald donuts all winter. And you start asking people, hey, do you know anybody that would have snow tires for this? And then somebody's like, I got some of those in my barn. You can have them. God works out things like this, but you have to take the initiative to talk yourself down. Those are things you can practice. Do I really have to have this? What would happen if I didn't have it? Do, do I need to buy this today? Leave the store. Okay, we needed to buy a car. We took a whole year to buy a car because I kept talking myself out of every car that we found. I don't really have to have that. I can wait long. I mean, you can really take your time and talk yourself out of so many foolish things if you just plan ahead, have a budget, use cash, and talk yourself down. Okay, wisdom from dad. This is what I wish dad would say. It's such a good deal. Why wait? Just borrow the money and figure out how to pay the payments later. That's what I wish dad would say to me. That, that's, that lines up with exactly how I feel, but he doesn't. Instead, he says, borrow carefully. Dad says, borrow carefully. What does the Bible say about debt? As far as I can tell, Bible, the Bible, the scriptures do not say that debt is a sin. But it does caution us to be very careful. It's a slavery issue. Proverbs 22, 7. The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is slave to the lender. This is wisdom literature. It's always true. It doesn't always play out exactly the way it says it's going to play out, but it's always true. There's wisdom in what Solomon is telling us. He's saying, he's saying I've experienced a lot of money and life, and he writes Ecclesiastes about all these things. He says, let me tell you, every time I watch people borrow money, the borrower is slave to the lender. Now, in this culture, it wasn't wrong to be a slave. You could be an indentured servant. You could say, you know what? You let me work your land and I'll be your slave for this many years and whatever percentage we agree on, I'll give you from working the land and then I get to keep the profit and I get to live there. It wasn't wrong to be a slave in this culture. But you better be careful who you decide your master is. You better be careful how many masters you take on. Better be careful how much slavery you're willing to sign up for. And that's what our Father would tell us. Look, there is, there is times when you may choose to take some debt, but be very, very careful about how much debt you're going to take and who those masters are going to be because it is going to be a form of slavery in your life. It is going to impact your free time. It's going to impact your family. It's going to have a financial, emotional, and spiritual impact on your life. It's going to impact how much rest you are allowed to have. Be careful who you sign up with to let be your master. Be careful how many masters you take on. What's difficult is that debt, debt has become incredibly easy. In fact, probably if you're younger than me, you don't remember a time when there wasn't uh, just debt everywhere. Like, you realize that credit cards are actually a relatively new thing. Like, they came out in the 50s. There was never credit cards before the 50s. Somebody had a great idea. It started with Supper Club. They started this idea that you could go out to dinner and you could eat dinner every week and then at the end of the month you would pay the bill. That's how credit cards got started. That's such a new idea. But, but people our age and younger, we don't remember a time when there wasn't credit cards. Maybe all of us in this room. I don't know. Maybe you're all used to it. That is so new. Debt is so comfortable for us. You can walk in to just about any store and apply for a card and buy a new wardrobe. I can go to Amazon and apply for a card and order a new big screen TV. I can drive two miles to the dealership. Well, now it's 17. I can drive 17 miles to the dealership and sign my name and drive away with a $60,000 truck with no money down. It's easier. This is crazy to me. You can buy a $15,000 house in Calumet, or at least you could for a long time. George would tell you maybe today you can't, but it'll come back. $15,000 house in Calumet, and you have to do all this paperwork to buy that house, and you buy that on a 30-year mortgage, your payments are going to be $150 a month. 
but you can go to Copper Country Ford and buy a $70,000 truck with no money. You sign your name and you drive away. It's that easy. And then the bill comes in the mail a month later. Debt has become so comfortable for us. And the marketing and the media has done their jobs so well, they've convinced us that we couldn't possibly be happy unless we're driving that truck. We couldn't possibly be happy unless we go to that new restaurant. We couldn't possibly be happy unless we have a new kitchen in our house, right? They're just so good at convincing us to be discontent with what God has already provided. And so we're just comfortable with signing up for more and more masters, and we live on credit all the time. Now, I realize and I recognize that to participate in this culture it's pretty tough to run a business or have a house without a mortgage or a car payment or some debt. I'm not saying to you that all debt is bad. I don't think our father is saying to you that all debt is bad. I think he's saying, be careful how much you sign up for. Be really careful what masters you allow to master you and own you. Be careful that you don't get so discontent that you just have to have more and more and more because the borrower is always slave of the lender. And at some point, they're going to own every minute of your peace and your life if you keep signing up for more debt. So dad would say, be careful. Now, I wish dad would say, you only live once. You could die in the night. I think you should spend all of your money today on yourself. That's what I wish dad would say. I'm like, you're right. Let's go. Spending spree. Free for all. But dad doesn't say that. Dad says, save consistently. Save consistently. In Proverbs 21.20, it says, precious precious treasure. See, where's James? I can't say that. Or what was Ethan? I can't say the word precious either. Precious treasure and oil are in a wise man's dwelling, but a foolish man devours it. So the concept here is that in a wise man's house, there's some left over. He, he sets a little bit of, a, of it aside. He saves it for company. He saves it for vacation. He saves it for a rainy day. He saves it, saves it for when he's sick and can't go to work. There's something left over that they didn't devour in a wise man's house. There's a little bit put aside. That's painful. But we need to hear it because look, a foolish man devours everything. That's a hard dose of reality this morning. That's, I think, why as I worked through this last night, I was like, ugh, you're telling me I'm a fool? I need to work harder at saving? Yeah, you do. You need to try harder. You need to work a little. You need to do it. Even if you've started 100 times, you need to start again. Start saving. And our Father wants to bless us. He's telling, this, telling us this because He wants to bless us. A foolish assumption is that everything is for my consumption. A foolish assumption is that everything is for my consumption. Wealth gained hastily will dwindle. Whoever whoever gathers little by little will increase it. And here's the key. And, And I actually did start saving a few years back, and this really blessed my life. If we don't save, when we have an emergency, we borrow. And here's how it blessed me. I looked at my, my life, my, my, my budget, and I said, man, every month, if I just average this out over the course of the year, every single month, I spend two, three, four hundred bucks on car repairs. Every month, hands down, especially as my kids get older, more cars, more junk, more stuff to repair. And I would turn, and, and so this was my pattern for years. Man, I can't afford that payment this month. Get a credit card pay the bill, we'll just pay for the new brakes, and then we'll figure out how to pay off the credit card. And then the next month would come, something else would break. Okay, we paid off 200 of the $400, but you take that card and you put it on the credit card again, now we're up to 600 bucks. Now you do that every month, month after month, and you can see how somebody gets to the point where they have $6,000 in credit card debt, because you just can't ever catch up. Now it was a really painful few months when I did this. Really painful. I mean, like, drudgery painful. But I just decided. 
I looked at my house payment, a couple hundred bucks a month, and I opened a separate bank account for my house payment. And I had my house payment automatically taken out of that bank account. And I, I took money out of every paycheck. I get paid t- every two weeks. So I took money out of every paycheck, and I used to just put enough in there for the house payment. You know, add it up, 52 weeks a year, do all the math. I just decided I'm going to take a house payment out of my paycheck, paycheck every two weeks, and I'm going to put it in that bank account. And so now instead of putting in the 300 and some dollars a month or $400 a month for my house payment, once a month, I'm putting it in there every two weeks. And then what I'm going to do is when my car breaks, I'm going to take the money out of that account to pay for my car. And that first few months was so hard because you're still paying the credit card payment and you're still trying to buy groceries and the car's still breaking and now you're putting money in this other account. And so it took a while for that to snowball. It took about six months for that to snowball. But after about six months of doing that, putting that extra payment in that other account, you know, for the last few years, I have not had to put a car repair on my credit card because there's just always money over there. It just, I go over there, and I have $287. This was last week, $287. Here you go. Put it, I have one debit card for that account. The only thing I use it for is car repairs and my mortgage. Here you go. Put it on the account. $800 in snow tires. Put it on the account. You know, and instead of using a credit card, now I'm not going backwards anymore. If we don't save then when we have an emergency, we borrow. It's always true. It's just what happens. And God, our Father, is saying, learn how, it's drudgery at first, but learn how to just start putting a little bit aside every single paycheck, every single month, and yeah, for a while, it's going to take a while for that to snowball, but if you trust me, if you know that I love you, you will do this. Okay. I wish God would say, I wish my father would say, I gave you all that stuff. I gave you all that money because I love you more than I love all the other Christians. That's what I wish dad would say, right? I love you best, which is why I gave you so much extra. That's not what our father says. He says, give generously. I did not give you all of that extra so that you could consume it and spend it on yourself. Your extra is purposeful, and I have something planned for you to do with it. Now, as Christians, we ought to live generously. We ought to plan our generosity. A Christian, listen to this very careful, a Christian who is not generous is having an identity crisis. Think about that. A Christian who is not generous is having an identity crisis because Jesus was the most generous person who ever lived. He gave everything, everything. He gave the kingdom, he gave his glory, he gave his life, he gave his service, he gave his body, he gave everything. He was so incredibly generous towards us who do not deserve it. And as a Christian, I am supposed to be Christ-like. I'm supposed to be a little christ I'm supposed to be just like Jesus. And so if I am not generous, then I have an identity problem. I, I'm having an identity crisis. Jesus followers have a plan for generosity and forgiving. But here's the thing I want you to catch about this. This is not about your money. The Father does not want you to give because he needs your money. The truth is he wants your heart. Our Father wants your heart, and he wants my heart. Look at these two passages of Scripture. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. The greatest competitor, the greatest competitor with God for your heart is your money. And God knows that. God knows the thing that's going to try to steal you away from him is your money. And Jesus doesn't need your money, but he knows you need to give it. He knows you need to learn to be generous. He knows you need, and I need, to let go of it 
and trust him so that he can have our heart. The generous man will be prosperous. He who waters will himself be watered. Generosity changes us from the inside out. It would be tempting to look at this and think, oh, this is a what goes around comes around verse. No, this doesn't mean that the generous man will have people be generous to him. This means that generous people experience joy and blessing welling up inside of them because they are generous people. And yes, sometimes it does come around that you are also blessed because you bless so many people. But what God, our Father, is actually saying to us is you will be more blessed if you learn how to be generous because your generosity is going to change you from the inside out. You're not going to hold on to that wealth anymore and that security that comes from it. That doesn't mean don't be wealthy. It just means be generous with what God has blessed you with. We put our faith and our trust in our Father instead of in our bank account. We overcome the power of wealth and its desire to master us as we give it away. We realign our hearts with Jesus, who was the most generous ever who ever lived, and we allow Him to manage our money. Honor the Lord with your wealth and from the first fruits of all your produce. This was an economy, uh, livestock, livestock economy. It was about wheat and cows and what we could grow. And and God says, give the first 10%. Give it to God. Now, in our economy, we we live with bank accounts and money and, and checkbooks. But I think God, our Father, has not changed from that Old Testament wisdom we, we, we live under the same God and tithing and generosity is kryptonite for greed and materialism. And I, I've said this to you before. That 10% number, now if you're not given 10%, that's okay. I mean, maybe you need to just start with $20 a week or maybe you just need to start with 2%. You need to just start working your way into this. None of this happens overnight. But that 10% number is such a good number because it's just enough that we feel it. It's just enough that we have some trust issues, right? After a while, that 10%, for many of you, that's a car payment or a house payment. You could own a vacation home if you're given 10%. It's enough to feel it, but it's not so much that it's going to really affect what you need every week. You know, 10% isn't going to make or break whether you get to eat. God says it's kryptonite, for that thing that wants to master your heart for greed and materialism. And so he says, honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first fruit of your produce so that your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Now catch this. This is not a magic wand. This is wisdom literature. It's not a magic wand. It's not like, okay, I'm going to give to God and that's going to force his hand to give to me. That's not the point. The point is, I'm going to trust God with my wealth instead of having my security in what I can accumulate. And that is going to revolutionize my entire life. It's going to put God in charge of my barns. It's going to put God in charge of my business. It's going to put God in charge of my vats. And, And when God is in charge, everything goes better. When God is in charge, the whole financial plan goes better. Wouldn't you like the creator of the universe in charge of your financial plan? Don't you think things would start to get better and better and better? And that's the point. This this wisdom from Solomon is not wave a magic wand. What he's saying to you is put God in charge of everything you have by trusting Him with your wealth and watch what He does with your finances and your financial plan. Watch how His wisdom blesses you over and over and over again. Now, Dad speaks into, speaks wisdom into every area of spending in our life. The money that we spend, the debt that we have, the savings plan, and our generosity. But big picture, our Father in Heaven says what we really need to do 
if we really want to get in line with the way he thinks and the way he operates, what we really need to do is rearrange that whole order. Stop bringing money in and spending first and then paying debt. And then if there's anything left, saving. And then if maybe there's anything left after that, maybe I'll be generous. Flip the whole thing upside down and give generously first. Look at what you bring in. Sit down and plan your budget. Look at what you bring in and give generously. Plan your giving. And then after you've given what God has laid on your heart to give, start saving consistently. I'm going to put this much aside every week. And then borrow more carefully. Look at the whole budget and say, you know what? I'm going to pay off some debt instead of buying a new car this year. And then spend cautiously and enjoy the rest. Right? Flip that all upside down and experience the wisdom of God working through your finances instead of you controlling it all. Now, Christian life is all about steps. And we have heard some of this before and we have taken some steps before. So first step is rearrange the order. First step is rearrange the order. Maybe you've done that before and you felt like it didn't work. Maybe you need to do it again. Maybe this is the first time that you've heard this And maybe today what you need to do is actually sit down and make a budget and rearrange the order of your budget and say, how much am I going to give to the Lord? How much am I going to put in the savings account? How am I going to pay off debt? How am I going to spend more cautiously? If you don't even know where to start, we have some financial advisors here in our church that are really good with money. And you need to call me and you need to say, I need need help to work through this. And, and you need to meet with some of these people and, and start to reorganize your budget. And that, the hard part is the first five, six months when you do that, it's, it's tough. It's drudgery because it takes a little while to snowball. You need to have some tenacity when you start going down this road. When you first start giving, and that, and that would be, I mean, that's where I started 20 years ago. First thing, first time, we were at our worst financial place, and I said, we're going to give 10% no matter what. Even if we don't eat, even if we lose our house, we're giving no matter what. And then years went by, okay, we're going to save no matter what. I don't, even if we can't pay a bill, we're saving money out of every paycheck. And then we're, now we're still learning how to borrow more carefully. I'm terrible at it, but that's something that God keeps laying on my heart. How do we pay off this debt? How do we never use credit cards? It's one step at a time, but maybe your first step is to meet with one of our financial advisors and say, can you help me look at what I make and how to budget this? It's going to take some tenacity, but if you trust God, if you trust God with your finances, he will help you through it. He will bless you. He will work out the wisdom in your life. You will see long-term blessing from this. And I, I got to leave you with this. As you wrestle with these things, because I'm not sure where you're at, you, you may be looking at your life saying, I've tried these things all my life and it never works. Guys, God's wisdom always works. So don't give up. Keep trying. I'm not sure where you're at and what step you're at, but I want to leave you with this last bit of truth, and I've kind of mentioned it throughout the sermon, but I just want to, I think this has got real teeth in it, and I want it to sink into your hearts. This is Paul from Philippians. He says, not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. This word is really the whole issue. It's the whole issue. It it influences every part of everything we've talked about. And it it comes down to, do I trust God with, with the circumstances he has me in today? This came from a guy who was naked, shipwrecked, beaten, and in prison. All those things he experienced. And he says, I know how to be content. That doesn't mean I know how to be content because eventually I won't be in prison anymore. That means I know how to be content even if I'm in prison forever. I've learned how to be content with the exact circumstances God has placed in my life. And he's going to tell us the answer. He says, I know how to get along with humble means and I know also how to live in prosperity. There was a time when Paul was very wealthy. 
In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and of going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. He says, I can do all things through him. He's talking about Jesus who strengthens me. So he says the whole key to being content with the circumstances that God has placed in my life is Jesus. Now let me go back to this for a minute. I told you, and I said it pretty quickly, when you start doing this, and I'm not sure what step you're on, where God has you, and what you need to do next, but when you start doing this, it's drudgery for about six months while it starts to snowball. In any part of this, whether it's giving or saving or paying off debt, it, it's a good six months of pain. Let me tell you that that could be some of the sweetest six months of your life if every time the pain came, you would just get on your knees and draw near to God and beg Him for help and, and just let Him show up in your life. Because when you start leaning into God's wisdom and trusting God and, and just believing Him, He shows up in a way that allows you to be imprisoned or shipwrecked or naked or beaten and sing praise. He shows up in a way that says, you know what, honey, we don't have any money. We can't even rent a movie. But I have never felt so close to Christ in all my life. I have never felt his presence like I do now. You know what? I don't know how we're going to make our house payment. We put that check in the offering and I don't know what's going to happen, but I just believe that God has got us. He's going to take care of us. And you see God show up. You know what? I, don't, I, I know it's really hard. We can't afford a Snickers bar. We, we, we're just going to have to live without it. But God is with us. That drudgery, it takes some tenacity and it is painful, but it can be some of the sweetest time in your relationship with Christ, if you can get your mind around the idea that I need to trust God and His strength to be content in the exact circumstances we're in because this, He's in charge of it. He's, in, he's ordered it. And He's with us. And I'm just going to keep leaning into His wisdom and leaning into Him. It can be so sweet. I would tell you that I have never experienced God and His intimacy the way I experienced him when we started doing these things, when we went through those painful, difficult steps. I just want to encourage you with that. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you that you never stop pouring out your wisdom on us. I thank you that you are so incredibly gracious and patient that we can fail over and over and over again and you still show up and you still rescue us and you still show yourself faithful I thank you that as long as we're alive, it doesn't matter if we're 17 or 70, if we take small steps towards truth and your wisdom, you bless us. You, you always do. You show up and you're with us and you're intimate with us and you bless us and you carry us along. And so, Father, each one of us in this room is at a different place in our Christian life and in our wrestling with money and finances. Each one of us still feels the call of that master money calling our name. And so I pray, Father, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would convict our hearts and help us to know what step we need to take. A lot of wisdom today. We're all at a different place. Help each one of us to know what you want us to do today, this week, next. And we pray this for your honor and your glory. Amen.